Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with State Land Commissioner and old friend Ray Powell to talk about the recent land exchanges dealing uh, in power transmissions, solar energy, and other things involving the State Land Office. Ray uh, served as uh, State Land Commissioner from 1993 to 2002 and was re-elected in 2010 for another term. I've always considered Ray Powell to be one of those upstanding public servants. And what he's done in the last four years has caused me a lot of optimism. And, uh, and I think uh, when he conveys what's been going on, it will, it will make you feel good, too. Um, so it's wonderful to have you here with us today, Ray. Thank you, VB, very much. It's a real uh, honor and opportunity to get to visit with you today and uh, in your beautiful library here. The state land office uh, plays such an important role in, the, in New Mexico's economy that you'd think that what it does and what its mission is, everybody would understand. But I think it's become clear to me now, and I'm sure it's very clear to you, that not many people understand what the, what the land office is and, and what the trust aspects of it are, or even how many acres or square miles you have under, under your authority. Um, and also... The way, uh, the way that you've been looking at it through the One Health Principle, could you sort of talk a little bit about that and, and give our audience a, a clearer view about what the land office is? Well, VB, uh, the land office is an incredible treasure for our state and for every citizen that lives here. When we became a state, uh, there was horse trading between New Mexicans and the federal government, and we acquired like every state west of the, of the Mississippi, state trust lands. And we got 13 million acres of these lands, and that's about 12% of our, our surface area of New Mexico. It's a huge asset. And uh, these were lands that at the, that point in time, uh, really nobody else wanted. Uh, and they were, each piece of land is designated f for one of 22 beneficiaries. Whatever's earned on that piece of land goes to that specific beneficiary. And it's the public schools, universities, hospitals, special institutions that care for young people like uh, the School for the Hearing Impaired, the School for the, the Blind, uh, Carrie Tingley Hospital, the New Mexico Military Institute, uh, our hospital up in Las uh, Vegas for people that have uh, uh, disorders, mental disorders. So uh, over the last uh, three years, this land has generated over two billion, with a B, billion dollars that you and I and our taxpayers didn't have to pay in additional taxes in support of these important institutions. And that amounts to about $850 per year for each working family that files income tax. So this is an enormous asset at and resource. It's all the seed corn that uh, generates our permanent fund. Uh -huh. And uh, it, what happens is when we take oil and gas or potash or, or uh, uh, grass or we do a commercial lease, uh, that money then is invested in the permanent fund and in a, a different fiscal tool, and so that'll be there for future generations, uh, for future young people, even when these uh, non-renewable resources are gone. So it's, it's an incredible uh, and valuable resource. The trick is, how do we use these working lands in an intelligent way and not create time bombs or liabilities or circular firing squads amongst our citizens, <laughs> but rather opportunities and keep these lands healthy? And uh, the One Health concept is very simple, is when we make decisions, really make them generationally. So we're looking to the future. So we're not inclined to, to make uh, decisions that leave the next generation holding the bag. And uh, it's healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy people. And it all fits together in that uh, if we do that, we're, we're leaving the legacy for future generations that's just as bright and vibrant as the ones we've been able to experience here in this beautiful place we call home, New Mexico. So we have a, about 13 million acres. The, does the state own all the mineral rights under its trust lands? One, two, are, is all of this land contiguous or is there a lot of it chopped up? 
um, I mean, 13 million acres, 12 percent of the state's land area is, is an extraordinary. It is. It's an enormous treasury, you know, huge potential. Um, and the land commissioner uh, has a lot of, because he's an independent elected official, uh, responsible to the voters, uh, has a tremendous amount of leeway as to what to do with those lands. I know that I've been very critical of past commissioners uh, who who seem to be um, involved in, how should I say it, a sort of a, a political cronyism. I've never thought that of you at all. Uh, but so there is a tremendous amount of power. And Let's talk a little bit more about that. You're, you're exactly right, VB. This is a very unusual elected position. Uh, there, in our enabling legislation, when we became a state, the two constitutional officials are the governor and, and the land commissioner. And I guess they were supposed to look over each other's shoulders, uh, you know, and make sure things ran right. But when we got these lands, it was under the model uh, of the East. And that was we were given four sections in each township. And what that means, it's four square miles in each 36 square miles. And I think the idea, the Eastern model, was figuring that all of our land in New Mexico at some point would be, uh, people would be living there, and these would be sites that you could build schools and you could do other activities. Not understanding the enormous difference of the Western United States yeah. and the fact that uh, we're a very arid environment. Uh, and so we've got land virtually every place across the state there are some areas where uh, we had land grants or there were so sovereign tribal nations that already had land so we got lands in lieu of those so we do have some large blocks of lands that just happen to be located in the four corners area where there weren't uh, other lands uh, taken up and in the permian basin uh, which, <laughs> really? which uh, yeah. that was before we knew there was oil and gas there. And this has been an enormous asset to our uh, school children and, and uh, yeah. our population because of, uh, of that enormous mineral wealth. Well, in, in that enabling legislation, New Mexico is very different than the other states. We have 22 states in our Western States Land Commissioners Association. New Mexico is different from every other one in that they decided to make it elected and they decided to, to give the land commissioner the power to sell the land, lease the land, or trade the land without anybody else's approval. Well, that's really unheard of, but it's in our constitutional enabling legislation. And that's why I so much appreciate the opportunity to visit with you and, and your viewers, because when people are paying attention to this office, and there's a lot of uh, noodling going along, uh, around in terms of talking to people and and asking people and consulting and collaborating really exciting good things can happen but when that isn't happening you can end up with dead of the deal uh, not uh, deals at the you know the darkest hour of night and things just flying out the back door of the land office so uh, again, the public needs to pay attention to what I do and what future land commissioners do to ensure we really optimize this incredible resource while we take care of the health of that land. And uh, that's the real, the, the real important thing. When I ran for land commissioner again, I made the promise that we wouldn't do any trades, any sales, any long-term leases without having public meetings and talking to the officials and uh, interested people in the community be going to be affected or the beneficiaries whose land uh, we were trading or selling. And uh, that's worked very well uh, because uh, the mistakes I've made at the land office, and, and I've made, I'm sure, plenty of them, is when I haven't consulted, when I haven't visited with the people that are going to be affected. Because if it's a bad idea and you, you put lots of sunshine on it, it very quickly becomes apparent that you ought not to do that, and it dies an early death. But what's more important and better is that when it's, a, it's got a germ of a good idea, it becomes a much better idea with that public participation and that scrutiny and that collaboration. So I'm really happy to report we're doing joint planning agreements with our local communities across the state. We don't have to meet any zoning or planning requirements. And that's nuts. Uh, because if you, the healthier the local community, the more valuable the adjoining state trust land. 
We want to do things that match the vision of that community. And each one of our 104 communities, VB, is different. Sure. And so we want to visit with that community and decide where, where do they want to be 50 or 100 years from now and how what we do helps them get there while supporting our, our school children. So we've done day, daycare centers, senior centers, affordable housing, master plan communities, business parks, recreational facilities, things that earn a lot more money for the school kids, but add real value to the community. And uh, uh, later in our discussion, a visit with you about creating jobs at the same time that allow our young people who were spending a lot of money to educate to stay in New Mexico with their families versus turning them into economic refugees. Just one tiny point of clarification. How much of the total amount of oil and gas that's extracted from New Mexico in the, in the San Juan and the Permian basins is on state trust land? VB, we were blessed with uh, enormous resources in oil and gas, and it's about between, it, it varies year to year, but between about 36 and 40 percent of all the oil and gas produced in New Mexico is on state trust lands, and we get a royalty uh, percentage from that. Uh, and it, it last year, uh, record year, uh, in the calendar year, $670 million were generated on these working lands. 94.5% came from oil and gas. And with these new technologies, the horizontal drilling, uh, it's taken a lot of fields that were looked at as being senescent, uh, you know, old and, and antiquated. With the new technologies, many of them being uh, developed at our outstanding uh, uh, institute in New Mexico uh, Tech, uh, these fields are, are vibrant again and will be generating uh, these resources for several more decades, which, which are important, uh, and that will keep our tax burden down. It's during this period of time we're working very hard to build that uh, next step and transition into the renewable energies, which we think we have just as bright a future, if not brighter, than what we've been blessed with with the non-renewable. One day in another conversation we can talk about fracking and other things, but this is, this is not the time or the place. I'd like uh, very much to hear about uh, the new uh, solar facility near Deming. It's supposed to be the largest one in the state, I believe. The, uh, the new uh, uh, wind, wind energy uh, array uh, in Torrance County, I think. Uh, the, um, the Hobbs Lee County algae uh, ethanol diesel plant <laughs> it's just horrible to me. Could we talk about that and about the impact that those will have on our, on our environment? Now, I'd, I'd like you to tell us as much as you can about them because they sound fascinating to me. Well, VB, I'm very excited about the renewable energy portfolio uh, that complements our non-renewable resources. Uh, when we got back to land office three years ago, uh, many of our lands were leased on five-year leases, which was very unusual. And what it did is it tied the lands down and it ensured that whoever had that lease could then, then be the one to make a lot of money if somebody came in and wanted to, to actually do something on the ground. It was kind of a speculative deal. Oh. The school kids wouldn't get the upside. Oh. Well, if there's some small silver lining in this horrible economy we've suffered through recently, is those have uh, expired. And in the last three years, our outstanding employees at the land office, and they're honest, honest ethical, hardworking public servants, we've developed 22 renewable projects on state trust lands hmm. that over the life of these projects will, will generate about a half a billion, with a B, half a billion dollars for our, our beneficiaries, the school kids. And that's just the beginning. A couple of, of really exciting ones. We've celebrated this last summer the largest uh, on-site uh, solar array in, in Albuquerque that uh, gives the solar energy to one of our leasees at our project, the Sandia Science and Tech Cor Park, MCOR. Uh, you know, they're the world's best at building uh, solar panels for orbiting satellites. They've now gone into the business of building uh, panels for uh, terrestrial use, huh. uh, which we're excited about because yeah. that gives us added value when somebody wants to come in and do a solar array. We're saying, 
great. We want to look at it, make sure it's in the right place and the community agrees. Uh, but also, rather than buy your solar, solar panels from China or Texas, buy them from New Mexico. Yes, and these are the best. They're, they're much more uh, efficient and effective, and they don't have to tote them a long distance. So we get that added value. So we're using the sun, using New Mexico's land, and using uh, a company that's actually building these on state trust land and paying us lease money. Huh. Uh, and uh, uh, we've got another one we're celebrating. It's being built as we speak down by uh, Deming, uh, and it's going to be, at least for a while, the largest solar array in New Mexico, about 50 megawatts on uh, 400 acres. And it'll generate about $14 million for our school kids over the life of the project. It'll supply enough uh, energy for, I think it's 18,000 homes in New Mexico. And we're doing it in a manner that we're teaming with the company and New Mexico State University, one of our beneficiaries, to do an asset inventory and a study to understand the impacts of that solar array on the local uh, land mm -hmm. so that we understand, is it affecting the local uh, vegetation, the local wildlife, as well as the migratory wildlife that comes through that area so that we can make adjustments and do it better and leave a lighter footprint on that site, but also on future sites. Uh, we have another uh, fantastic opportunity in Torrance County. Ibadrola, which is a company from Spain, has uh, leased our, is in the process of leasing our land and working also with the private uh, landowners for a thousand megawatts. That's as much energy, uh, if we used it here in New Mexico, it supply the whole state. Uh, about 400,000 homes. Really? It, it's just an extraordinary uh, project. And on state trust lands, it'll, it'll produce about 220 megawatts. That would be our portion. Produce, I believe, about $50 million, uh, million dollars over the life of that project. And what makes it so exciting is that uh, we're getting not just the, the rental from the leased land, but we're getting a percentage of the electrons, what they're getting paid for, the electrons that would be going to California. So it's, it's a working relationship that gives us a return on an investment of about 16% which is, is just an extraordinary uh, return. And it, again, will benefit our school kids, but also keep our taxpayers' bills down. And this is wind energy. This is wind en energy. Uh, down by Deming, uh, it's, it's solar, but in Torrance County, it's wind energy. And again, we're working with the company to be very sensitive. We're not placing these in, in uh, fly pathways for migratory wildlife. Uh, we're, we're doing it concurrently with other agricultural uses. Our sportsmen can continue to go out on these lands. They're not blocked off from it. So this is a real additive value. And it'll, it uh, brings in a, a pulse at the beginning of construction jobs. And then it'll, it'll leave a, a few long-term jobs, but it'll create a, a, a healthy revenue stream uh, for a long, long time with a very light footprint. The, the, the other one that uh, you had mentioned, uh, I'm real excited about this. We signed a 1,400-acre business park lease uh, with, the, with the community of Hobbs. And what we're trying to do, again, is help local communities prosper. And uh, Hobbs is, is doing very well with the oil and gas boom right now, but they're also very intelligent in terms of diversifying their, their uh, portfolio down there. The first resident in this business park is a company out of Cambridge, Massachusetts called Jewel. And they have patented algae that they take a waste product from the oil and gas industry, a saline uh, uh, disposal water, which you usually have to pay a lot of money to get rid of. It's a toxic waste. They're using this algae, the saltwater disposal, New Mexico sunshine, and uh, as you tinker with the DNA of this algae, you can produce jet fuel, uh, <laughs> diesel fuel, really? regular gasoline, or kerosene. And this is just the beginning of 
what will hopefully be uh, projects across the globe from this company and the land office and the school kids will get a share of that. So we're taking a toxic waste, turning it into a, a, a profitable product instead of just dumping it, creating good jobs for New Mexicans and, and enhancing our tax base. And these are the types of projects that really represent what One Health is about. And that's thinking on the long term, looking at the big picture and saying, how do we solve uh, these problems without creating additional ones? And VB, this may sound, sound grandiose, but I think uh, you've been talking about this for years. New Mexico has more intellectual capital than most places on the planet. Our problem is we've kind of siloed it, and these silos have a hard time talking with each other. Well, we break down those silos, and there's no reason why we can't lead the planet in terms of having companies that go across the globe and do restoration and re remediation projects. But the companies are located in New Mexico, so our kids have a chance to experience the world, do good work, do well at the same time, and the checks come back to New Mexico for companies like Juul and like MCOR that produces the satellite panels. And that makes us healthier and uh, more resilient without leaving a heavier footprint here in New Mexico. So I know that, that uh, the state lands also uh, uh, will house portions of what's known as the Tres Amigas project, which as I understand it, and um, is, it's, a, uh, tra it's not a power generating um, uh, project, it's a transmission project that allows renewable energy sources and their problems with intermittency wind power when there's no wind and uh, uh, sun power when there's when it's at night to be inserted into an energy flow and then do away with the intermittency problem so and it um, it takes as I understand it, it takes power from west coast a west coast grid and east coast grid and the Texas grid uh, and that's partially on trust land Yes, VB, and, and it's projects like this that are really looking uh, to the future and, and very visionary in how we use the incredible renewable energy resources and the potential we have in New Mexico and, and, and lead the, not just the country but the globe in doing innovative things. And uh, as you've mentioned, renewable energy, uh, particularly wind and solar, it's always been, well, it's intermittent. Well, if we can, again, uh, create uh, mechanisms to keep this flow constant, then uh, we've got a whole new world. Yeah. And the uh, portions of this will be sited on state trust land. And we're excited about working uh, on projects like this that will literally change uh, our footprint and uh, lessen that footprint on this globe. So I know that uh, that the state land office has also worked out a deal between Sandoval County and uh, Mesa del Sol to exchange some lands, uh, and I'm not totally clear about what that is, but I, because I don't know what they're going to do at Mesa del Sol. But anyway, you're going to tell us. So yes, VB, we during our, my previous administration we signed our first joint planning agreement with Sandoval County where again, we'd sit down with the local leadership and the business community and the educators and say, how do we really optimize that we uh, the land we have in your area so that it matches and fits your community, that it creates opportunities and it doesn't create liabilities. And one of the, the, the uh, spinoffs of that was they were really looking to the future and saying, what do we do with our solid waste? Uh, where do we put it and how do we again treat it uh, in a manner that doesn't create a problem for the future. So they've come up with a, an area and it, geologically it was very suitable. It was on state trust lands uh, where they wouldn't be creating a, a potential time bomb for the future. This is Sandoval County. In Sandoval County. Okay. And what we said to them is that we would work with them to, to facilitate this, but that we didn't want to be the, the landlord for a landfill and have that liability for the trust for the future. So what about trading, finding other land in another place of equal value 
and trading that so that they would get that piece of land that was particularly suitable for a landfill and the trust would get a piece of land that was much more appropriate for commercial development and would earn a lot more money for the school kids so it's equal value and so we we put on our thinking caps and looked around the area and one of the pieces of land became available in Mesa del Sol which is uh, another state land office project that had uh, been uh, infrastructure had come right up to the area and uh, the previous administration at the land office had sold off uh, that was just very ripe for commercial development and that would earn a whole lot more money. And we did this exchange, a real win-win. So Sandoval got a, a site for their landfill that was geologically sound, that would be there for decades and decades in the future, that would really uh, ensure their community's future. And the land office got a piece of land in our Mesa del Sol project that was really ripe for commercial development, would earn a, a lot more money for our school kids, keeping our taxpayers' bills down, and in, in the course, on long-term lease, generate a lot of jobs. So that's part of this One Health concept, working with local communities to see where it is appropriate uh, to do uh, commercial activities, but also potentially land exchanges. And we're working very closely with the Bureau of Land Management uh, across the state. We have a, a VB about 160,000 acres of state trust land that remain in very critical and important conservation areas. Uh, that also have important cultural uh, significance to our sovereign tribal nations, where we shouldn't be doing uh, commercial development. Well, in the past, I've worked very hard to trade out of these areas, Petroglyph National Monument, Chaco Canyon, Tent Rock, uh, the Bistai, uh, the new National Monument up by Taos, where we had state trust lands that we shouldn't be doing gravel pits and, and, and uh oil uh, rigs and other things. It just didn't fit that land. So we're trading out, getting equal value to protect those sites in perpetuity, but get other sites that are appropriate for commercial development that again will help create jobs for our local communities, good jobs, but also keep our taxpayers' bills down. And we're working with the BLM uh, in, as part of this identification of property uh, to trade lands out of uh, the prairie chicken area, which is in the western plains of New Mexico, which is a beautiful species, a, a wonderful species that we want to protect. Uh, and when we protect that, uh, we can get other lands that are more appropriate for commercial development. Uh, we're also working uh, with the, the BLM on conservation agreements. Uh, we set aside uh, during my administration over the last three years 250,000 acres to protect the sand dune lizard. Huh. And we did it uh, with the oil and gas industry's help, with the agricultural community's help, and with the environmental community's help to figure out, all sitting at the table together, are we bright enough to figure out how to protect this important species while we use the natural resources? And what we figured out, yes, we are. If we take the right steps and really understand the importance of this species and not do things that degrade the environment or put the species at risk. We were told by U.S. Fish and Wildlife by taking this proactive step, we kept the species from being listed as an endangered species, which allows agriculture, oil and gas uh, to continue, but under strict guidelines uh, so that we're not putting the lizard at risk. Uh, so these are these are the types of things that we're working on. Uh, just to go back to uh, to Sandoval County and Mesa del Sol, I don't think uh, Mesa del Sol is in Sandoval County, so I'm a little tiny confused, a bit confused about how uh, the state land office and, and and the county work the land trade. So could you dot the i's and cross the t's on that one for us a little bit? 
VB, the, the land in Sandoval County is state trust, was state trust land where they wanted to put the landfill that was appropriate geologically. The land that we wanted to acquire that had high commercial value that we could earn a lot of money uh, for the school kids was in Bernalillo County at Mesa del Sol. So it was a uh, fair market value, a trade for a trade, uh, giving up the land in Sandoval County, acquiring land in Bernalillo County. And what makes it a little bit more confusing uh, is that uh, Mesa del Sol is one of our state land office projects. It's the largest infill project in North America. And when we started it during my previous term, I made the commitment that we do uh, economic development uh, first before adding rooftops so we weren't just creating sprawl, so that we'd have an economic engine that would support the entire community. We did a regional park, we did the amphitheater, we did a number of things to add value to the entire community. Well, unfortunately, the 3,000 acres, which now, since we started it, has has is home to 2,500 good jobs, paying twice the salary of the rest of the community, uh, rather than being on long-term lease, which was our vision, so it would continue to produce income forever for our beneficiaries, was traded off by the last land commissioner for uh, the Dixon Apple Orchard and an adjoining 9,000 acres in Sandoval County. Uh, so we went from the, the most valuable commercial real estate in the state to a beautiful place with important cultural resources, but that was only earning under good conditions, uh, uh, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. And they happened to throw in the adjoining 9,000 acres to the orchard for a 70-year lease for $100 a year. Uh, and I'm still uh, scratching my head uh, trying to understand how that was in the best interest of the trust. But this gets us back to why we're acquiring some important commercially uh, important land in Mesa del Sol. Now, the infrastructure has been drawn to this site. Uh, the developer paid for that infrastructure. We'll get the upside of that and we'll earn a lot more money for the school kids. Uh, now that we've talked about the sort of migraine causing uh, complications and very interesting stuff, I think. I'd love you to, to sort of tell us uh, uh, some of the wilder stories about about the state land office. Uh, I mean, like the river of tires uh, in Mora County, uh, or like the landfill that you discovered way up at the top of, of Terrace Royal at some point, and, and things like that. It's just amazing to me what kinds of boneheaded things normally nice human beings will do to land without even thinking about it. Well, VB, uh, you've, you really hit the nail on the head, and that's why we've instituted the One Health program at New Mexico. Healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy people, looking at decisions generationally and using as much sunshine as possible to get collaboration from the people that are going to be affected by projects. When I got back to the land office, I, I really, I was astounded, dumbfounded. I thought it was a joke when I learned that someone, one of our leasees, who was uh, self-admittedly running a local landfill, uh, was diverting the tires uh, to a piece of trust land and chucking them in to, to an arroyo. And we ended up with hundreds of thousands of tires. Uh, it just was uh, an a legal landfill, uh, and it was totally inappropriate. If those tires had caught on fire, we would have had a uh, petroleum fire that would have b burned for months, if not years, created enormous environmental havoc, diverted the revenue stream away from our children's education into cleaning up a Superfund site. So I said, uh, and the previous land commissioner uh, signed a document at the end of his term saying that this was a world-class soil erosion project. Well, I, I, I <laughs> didn't agree with that. So we went to the individual and said, you need to clean this up at your expense. And after two and a half years, uh, he did clean it up at his expense. We also fined him and he's paying for the restoration 
of the grasses and, and the health of that land. So the taxpayers didn't have to carry that burden. And the message uh, to people across the state, because most of our leasees are honest, ethical, hardworking people, but if somebody thinks they're gonna take advantage of the trust and that the taxpayers are gonna have to pay the, the bill while they put the profit in their pocket, think again because we'll find them and we'll make them pay for it. And this is one demonstration of that, is you don't trash the trust. And, uh, you know, it, it just, it, it was unconscionable. You could see this thing, there were so many tires, you could see it from space, uh, you know, literally. Uh, so, but it's cleaned up, the tires are gone, the taxpayers didn't have to foot the bill, and uh, the message has been sent to the folks out there, uh, treat the the trust land with respect and uh, it's our working land but it also is the home to to many other species and it's a place that many of our our residents uh, recreate and go hunting and go fishing and uh, we want to have it uh, just as as healthy uh, for future generations as we've been able to enjoy well i was uh, uh working on a book called called the orphan land i got very interested in how much dumping was done into terrace arroyo uh, and uh, uh, particularly during the Cold War. And, um, and then I got to talking to you at one point, and you told me a story about it, about refrigerators or a refrigerator or some appliances coming down to Harris Arroyo. And, I, and I, I loved that story, and I wanted you to tell our audience about it, too, because this is the kind of thing that happens on, on trust land. They're so far apart, and there's so many of them that people just dump their stuff on it you know you're you're right and we were getting calls from residents in the south valley when there'd be a big rain event the largest arroyo in in our county in bernalillo runs through the tijeras uh, area and suddenly refrigerators and other small appliances were showing up in their front yards and they were saying where on earth are these coming from well, unfortunately, a previous uh, land commissioner and the community had decided to locate um, major landfill for Albuquerque in the Tijeras Arroyo. And, you know, that was a different time, but I just can't imagine backing your trucks up into the Tijeras Arroyo, dumping the trash, and not thinking about what happens in this arid environment when we get a big rain event. Uh, and a lot of water, a wall of water comes down the arroyo, what happens to that trash? So this is why we've instituted One Health, really looking at the big picture over a long period of time, ensuring the decisions that we make are good generational decisions and we're not leaving time bombs, that somebody doesn't wake up one day and a refrigerator suddenly is in their front yard, uh, that, that we don't put our groundwater at risk. Uh, that we have a place that, that again, uh, every living creature in New Mexico prospers because the healthier this land, the healthier the watersheds, the brighter our future as, as people and, and primates. So this is all tied together. We've got to, when we make decisions, have as much sunshine as possible, have as much community involvement as possible. So when the bonehead ideas, as you've mentioned, come up, they, they quickly get an early uh, dead on arrival certificate. But the good ideas become much better when the community is involved and adds their input. So I, I thank you for the opportunity to visit with you and your viewers. When they pay attention to government and when there's a lot of sunshine, good things happen. But when any of us go to sleep and don't pay attention, bad things happen. We started out, uh, VB, with 13 million acres of land given to us. When you sell the surface, you have to keep the mineral estate. So we still have 13 million acres of mineral estate. But I'm sorry to report that the best 4 million acres of state trust land surface are gone. Now, in some instances, it was for legitimate uh, reasons. But too often, I believe, it was to somebody's brother-in-law, business associate, or political crony that was the only one that knew this was happening on the county courthouse steps, that this land was going for sale. By the public being engaged and involved, and by us making the commitment that no trade, no sale, no long-term lease would occur without public involvement and sunshine, 
we avoid that and we keep that 9 million acres of surface and 13 million acres that we have in the mineral estate in the portfolio forever generating revenues for our, our school children, hospitals, universities, but also providing a place for our citizens to recreate, to go hunting and fishing. I've made our lands available to our citizens if they have a game and fish license that they can access them. In Texas, there are no public lands. If you want to go outdoors, you pay through the nose somebody that owns their land to access that land. That's not New Mexico. We're blessed with federal public lands and state public lands. And that's what, again, you shouldn't have to be rich in order to enjoy the beauty of New Mexico. Ray, thank you so very much. This was really enlightening. I just had a wonderful time. Thank you very much again, VB, for joining you and your viewers. Uh, the more public involvement, the more sunshine, the more effective uh, the state land office is and government is in general. I greatly appreciate the opportunity.